actually lived in Chesley most of their lives, and three that are surprise gifts, and our two ladies, one on the rocker and one on the other chair, the, um, next to the table there, Mrs. Fabian and Mrs. Dickinson will introduce their special gifts. Now, you know these two young ladies that are near the table need no introduction. What I should properly say is, let me present them again to you, because you have met them many and many a time on the main street, I'm sure. So without any further ado, I would now like to present a very gracious lady from Chesney who is going to do some honors for us. I'm sure you all are familiar with our good Bernice.
several of these Indians walking single file, coming in town. The squaws had baskets of, uh, uh, that they had made tied to their head, to the top of their heads, uh, to get back to the school. Our kindergarten and first grade were on one end of the first floor, while the other end was divided into three rooms with two grades each. Our, uh, our country school, uh, no, then the eighth grade was on the second floor with the high school and, uh, and the high school rooms. The, um, our country schools then talked to the eighth grade and the children from there came into our school to finish. In the lower grades, our teachers always read a chapter out of some current book or something, and I can well remember uh, Beautiful Joe, Black Beauty, and uh, Mrs. Wiggs of the Cabbage Patch, um, and Widow Callaghan's Boys. Uh, Friday afternoon was devoted to, uh, to a program when we sang our favorite songs. Sometimes it was Michigan, My Michigan, and also spoke pieces. The big opera house in town uh, was used for uh, graduation and uh, special occasions. When the whole school, uh, these special occasions, we enter uh, the entire school entertained the parents and the public with uh, uh, music and uh, song and uh, uh, poetry. Um, we had to have a lunch room for our country school uh, children. Uh, for their dinners, and so they built benches around the uh, edge of the furnace room, and um, uh, we ate there. Uh, our first school built here was remodeled several times. A new uh, gymnasium was added, and in 1924 it was dedicated to the to uh, uh, the. Um, uh, to one of our graduates who gave his life in the First World War. Uh, this was Arthur Thayer. A uh, bronze plaque was put upon the wall at the time. Uh, where the, when the gymnasium became part of the cafeteria, the plaque had to be removed. And that is now in the office of, the, uh, uh, of our school and uh, is taken out on special occasions. Um, Francis... Uh, Oh, where did you go to school? You want? <clears throat> I didn't hear you, Mabel. Let's talk oh, right into this. There. Right in the mouth. <clears throat> in 18... How? Oh. Uh, I'm not used to this. No, no. Just talk right into it. Okay. I have to talk as loud because I'm hoarse. Okay. Close to your mouth. Well. Close to your mouth. There. I guess somebody will have to wait on me stand there in the hole there. I started to school in September. In 1889, my two sisters and I all started the same day. And we had to walk through the woods all the way, a kind of a cow path, for three quarters of a mile. My mother dressed us in bright colors. And so she could watch us till we got to my grandmother's. And then my grandmother would watch us till we got to school. And the schoolhouse was built of logs. And uh, we had um, just plain board benches to sit on with the tables to put our books on. And, of course, we had the usual bucket and tin dipper that they had no schools for everybody to get germs. Well, our school only went to the sixth grade. And if you passed your grades, you could go to Sherman, five miles away to the town school. But for those 25 youngsters, I don't think 
many of them ever went to town school but me. I worked for my board and uh, room, and uh, I went for Christmas time, and then I developed a fever of some kind, and I couldn't go back to school for so long. I didn't want to go back, so that was the end of my school education. And I stayed around home helping mother for a while, and when I was a little past uh, 13, I went to town to work for uh, Mr. Bradford's home, doing the housework. And, uh, and they had a two-story house and uh, a stove upstairs in two rooms a stove downstairs in two rooms and a range in the kitchen and the stove in the basement. So I was kept busy all the winter just bringing in wood and feeding stoves and carrying out ashes and pumping the water and cleaning lamps and washing lamp chimneys and filling them seems so I spent my whole time at that. But <clears throat> had to get the work done besides. And we had um, Jenny Bullion used to come every winter, every fall in September, and she'd stay about three, four months sewing for everybody. Uh, that uh, customers and for Mrs. Bradford and their daughter. And in the afternoon, I was to have my work done and cleaned up and sat down and so was Jenny. And then press things. And so she taught me how to sew and how to make my own patterns. There was no patterns from a dressmaker's chart. I learned about as much there as I'd ever learned in school. And uh, I, I worked there for five years, and I got a real education in cooking and sewing and house cleaning and bringing in wood and everything. So after, if when 1903, after five years there, I married Frank Dickinson. He was a <coughs> engineer at the uh, broom handle factory in music. And he worked to, uh, for, um, he worked 12 uh, hours a day. He worked 12 hours a day and seven days a week for $10.75. That was good wages then. And we managed, we built, bought an acre lot with a little three-room house on it and fixed it up a little and got along okay. But the ha the, they run out of timber for the factory, so we had to quit work there, and uh, Dick was offered the job in Ann Arbor in uh, Owasso at the Ann Arbor car shop as an engineer, so we moved up to Owasso, put our household goods on the Ann Arbor freight car, and up to Owasso we went. Oh, and I thought it was wonderful up there. I had uh, gas lights and water and sidewalk. And uh, everything. And uh, Dick got paid every two weeks. He got um, $25 a week up there. My, that was a lot of money, I thought. So. And they didn't pay by check. They used the 
you got your pay envelope towards the month. So in that pay envelope was $50, two $20 gold pieces every month, and a $10 bill. Well, I was bound I was going to save on those $20 gold pieces every month. So, but once in a while, I missed. But that didn't last forever either. So we, uh, uh, when they um, run out of timber for the mill, why we went uh, to, uh, Well, that was music. I forget. I went to music to live, and all that happened in music. I like that. Excuse me, I'm no actor. And uh, we got on the Ann Arbor train, put our household goods and everything, and went to watch all the music. And Dick worked in the Ann Arbor car shops there as an engineer. And uh, there's where he got his gold bills. And that lasted about six years. And we had to move again. So we, Dick saw an ad of Mr. Cantor's in the Owato paper from Chesney. So uh, he took the job up there as machinist, and uh, and uh, he he wanted they wanted the man could was a good machinist and could repair cars too. So we went up there, and so I went back to pioneer living again without my gas and and lights and sidewalks and running water. I had to carry water. We uh, moved up to Chesning in 1914. And, oh, we had a spring. We moved there May 15th, and we had a spring like we had this year, just rain, rain. And we had to move on a truck with a horse team and it took 12 hours to drive that truck over to Chesney with our household got goods from Owasso. And, and I uh, lived in two houses the first year I was there. It was hard to find a decent place to live way back then. I lived in two different houses, and then we moved over on Front Street across from Mabel. And things began to look better for me. I forgot about the Wassel bright lights and turned into having a good time with the rest of them. We, uh, Mabel. Wonderful. Now we know where you went to school. Now we know where you went to school. Uh, social activities in our town were many. When a new barn was built, they always had to have a dance before the barn was used. And there was always a trip to the depot to see, watch the trains come in or see the train come in and see who got on and off. And, and then after the train came in, we had to go to the post office to wait for the mail to be delivered after the gray man had bought the bags of mail down from the uh, from the post or from the uh, depot, uh, or else we went into one of the stores and we watched uh, or looked over a new display of china that the store had just put in. Uh, with several several millinery stores here, we had a fine time trying on hats in the every season. Uh, these hats were bought. And very plain, and uh, then they hired a milliner to come and uh, 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 a special milliner to come and for that season. 
lodges were especially liked, and almost everyone in town belonged to either the Maccabees, the Woodmen, the Royal Neighbors, the Oddfellows, the Rebecca's, the Masons, or the Eastern Star. Uh, the farmers had the gleaners, and a few ladies operated a library, and some wives, who didn't help their husbands in his affairs, called on all the newcomers. Uh, a few took care of the needy with days, days that they had spent sewing quilts to give them. Uh, the Veteran Society was active, and the women's group always had charge of Memorial Day program and decorating a, a veteran's graves. Uh, sometimes there was a program in the opera house, and then the lumber wagons took the children to the cemetery. All children must be dressed in white. Uh, one year we had a snowstorm on the eve of Decoration Day. Uh, that, uh, uh, the next morning, it was sunny but cold. My mother would not let me wear my white dress. All the rest were in white, and the women would not give me a bouquet or let me march with them. I was heartbroken. Our first, op our first opera house was over a store where Newrich now stands. It was quite a job to carry trunks and, and uh, scenery up and down the narrow hall and steps that went upstairs. Then the big opera house was built, and some quite large shows came to town. We had it used for dances, card parties, masquerades. One pioneer picnic was held in there roller skating, and uh, uh, finally motion pictures. During the late years, a balcony was built for the sightseers. Sleigh rides were popular, and someone would furnish a bobsled with plenty of horse blankets and buffalo robes and straw on the bottom of the sled. We would go to someone's house and uh, uh, pull taffy or uh, have a hot lunch before going home. Uh, one, uh, one group came to my house, and as my folks had purchased a small first phonograph, we were using the round wax records, we played songs and hymns, some of the, some of Seuss's band numbers. Uh, uh, then one of them told of the country fellow who went to the city, and, and on a streetcar ride, he told the motorman how marvelously he was he was enjoying the trip to the city, and he just hated to go home. In parting, the motorman says, oh, I'll run across you sometime. The fellow looked around. Uh, you could uh, hear the consternation in his voice when he replied, not if I see you first. Uh, Francis? Uh, Francis, do you remember, uh, uh, were you interested in any of the lodges? Yes, I joined the Maccabees and um, the Eastern Star, and Dick joined the Masons here, and uh, uh, we had uh, oh, lots of entertainment in those days besides, but the Maccabees used to put on a home talent play every year, and we really made money with that. We'd go to Brant and put it on in the St. Charles a couple nights, just named two nights. It was a real show, and uh, the stars used to have beautiful parties in the opera house. Mr. Campbell had the opera house. And um, we'd uh, get an orchestra from Flynn and the Wasso for different parties and decorate those halls. It was some job, but not a party, but we really had a good time at it. And the firemen used to have a fireman's ball and dinner. Seems though there was so much going on. Seems like there was so much going on, and we was always going somewhere, doing something. And uh, oh, I see. Hmm. 
Many of our graduates were, uh, became quite distinguished after leaving here. To mention just a few, John Jackson, whose wife was the daughter of our lumber baron, Robert H. Nason, and whose house still stands on the north end of Front Street. Jackson was a senator from our district uh, to Lansing, Michigan for several terms. Mrs. Mary Tubbs Bauer was the first worthy matron of our Chesney Eastern Star and became worthy grand matron of the Grand Chapter of Michigan. J. Mace Andrus went from here and with his wife published school books of health and nutrition. During the Hoover administration, he was called to the White House several times for consultation. Uh, another graduate was Warren A. Ward, now of Evanston, Illinois who left here to work with Gin and Company of Chicago. They were publishers of school books, and from there he became an influential man in his city. Lyle Muffet, whom many of us of you may remember, is now in Austin, Texas. His office is with the federal veterinarians. Uh, many of you are familiar with our own Colonel Mark L. Ireland and his wife. Mark felt he paid his debt to Chess Ning when he left us his book, Place of the Big Rock. Uh, now may I introduce my ghost girls. Uh, this is Virginia Bunker, my granddaughter. She's wearing her great-grandmother's dress. This is Linda Kofus, my granddaughter, and she's wearing her grandmother's, my grandmother's wedding skirt but my mother's uh, uh, or blouse. Um, and then I have a great granddaughter, Karen Crowfoot. She has on my mother's wedding dress. I got too much ever to poise, I couldn't wear any of them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Beautiful memory of you is mine is a quote from a famous uh, author and poet. I think that Mrs. Dick, you should tell them about this dress you're wearing. Oh, this dress is my daughter's wedding dress. It's 44 years old. And how old are you? And And how old are you, Mrs. Dick? I am 92. And Mrs. Babian, will you tell the audience how old you are? Well, let me see, 87. 87. So if anyone... <laughs> so if I ever am... Uh, at an age of 90 some or 80 some and anyone says to me my but you look decrepit or my you look good or my you still have a big mouth I'm going to say to them how lucky I am I hope you are that lucky I think these ladies have done a beautiful job and they brought these secret gifts with them. Let's give them one more big hand. And thank you, Mr. Brown. <laughs>